Good morning, everyone. We welcome you this morning to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Northern Nevada, where it is our mission to grow together in love, faith, justice, and joy. My name is Xiomara Rodriguez, and I'm honored to serve as your worship associate this morning. And I'm really looking forward to our service together. No matter where you are today, if it's inside the sanctuary or on Zoom, you can enjoy and participate in our service. If this is your first time here or your 100th and first time here, we're glad that you're here. If you carry the weight of the world in your shoulders or enter through the doors with a song in your heart and a skip in your step, we are glad you're here. If you're the loudest voice in the town square or the subtle hands behind the scene, we are glad that you're here. If you have failed once or a thousand times, we are glad that you're here. If you sing like the angels or mumble behind the hymnal, we are glad that you're here. This, is a communi this community is what it is because of your presence. So welcome. Welcome into the space of love, support, justice, compassion, fellowship, and worship. We are glad you're here. Regardless of racial identity, age, economic circumstances, immigration status, sexual orientation, or gender identity. We are glad you are here. Here at UUFNN, each month we also give folks an opportunity to share generosity by sharing a des with a designated nonprofit. Share the play recipient for the mo month of March is Nevada Hopes. Nevada Hopes is dedicated to building a healthier community by providing primary health care to those who otherwise would have no access. Undocumented immigrant, on or underemployed, those experiencing homeless, uninsured or underinsured, all have access to quality health care on a sliding scale. In addition to medical care, HOPE helps connect people with services that support overall well-being, including clothing, shelter, mental health care, and addiction recovery. Other services include education around health, money hab healthy money habits, LGBTQ support, teen health, and sexual health. Uh, Hope is an Hope was instrumental in creating the Hope, Hope Spring, which is a safe place for people experiencing homeless. It provides 30 individual sleeping units surrounding 3,200 square feet facility, which includes restrooms, showers, laundry, and kitchen. The, this facility also accepts dogs, which is really good. We all, ha we all know that there's a shortage of affordable housing is critical in this community. The service that Nevada Hopes provides is instrumental in meeting those challenges. Also, God, I'm glad that some of the COVID rules are, have been changed a little bit. Social distances is no longer required, and we will continue limiting at attendance in this room. If you feel more comfortable doing so, this means folks can sit together, stand close, shake hands, and especially hug. <laughs> I have missed hugs. Uh, we shall ask all to respect the wishes of folks who choose to continue social distance practice, open communication with one another, and be intentional about honoring personal boundaries. We no longer require placards and limit on the number of people in the rest areas. We were, uh, the wearing of high quality masks continue to be required because our members and friends include higher portion of folks who are more vulnerable to serious illness and we want to make sure that UUFNN uh, a medical, is a medical safe spot for all of us. Those of you in soon will remain muted during the service but you can put your comments in the chat box and we can also 
stay on, uh, and you can also stay after the service for uh, coffee time. So no matter where you are today, sit back and enjoy. Thank you for being with us today. Just as I was about to get up, my hearing aid came off, so. <laughs> Although I guess I don't need to hear myself. Well, you know, as we, as we look out at the folks here in the, in the great room and, and on the screen, zooming into our service, I can say that we all have different reasons for being here. Many of us have giving, given up on other religious experiences, but are searching for a way to connect with others on a spiritual basis. Some have specific social issues that our fellowship have dealt with, and some may like that we include earth-based beliefs and systems into our religious experience. All these experiences are also what keeps us as members and friends, but what I hear most from folks who've been with us for a while, is that it's a close friendships and camaraderie among all of us that cements us to this fellowship. Our fellowship is now about 64 years old, but there were other UU connections prior to that. Today, you'll hear from one of our longest serving members, Betty Hulse, talk about those early years. Now, I should mention that her husband, Jim is, also joins her as the longest serving member, the two of them, uh, as you'll hear. And then coming close behind, Lois and I will serve up some more stories about our shared history. So in the words of UU President William Schultz, come into this place of peace and let its silence heal your spirit. Come into this place of memory and let its history warm your soul. Come into this place of prophecy and power and let its vision change your heart.
I forgot to do that before. So I'm going to ask Lois to come in and help me light the chalice, please. And as she does that, we light this chalice for the light of truth. We light this chalice for the warmth of love. We light this chalice for the energy of action. There. Yes. We have a successful lit chalice. <laughs> when I first talked to Dave about this program, I intended to begin uh, about Unitarian Universalists in Nevada. But since my story and Jim's story begins with this congregation, I decided we should start with the organization of this one first. So I have changed the sequence. I thought it best you might be more interested in that aspect. In about 1940s, the Unitarian Universalist Association, or the Uni Unitarian Universalists, before they merged, began to think about small groups. They wanted to increase their membership. They wanted to increase their congregations. So they, de they decided to center their attention on beginning lay-led fellowships. This was nationwide. The Unitarians used a list from the Church of the Larger Fellowships that they found in various communities that lived by themselves. They contacted these people and said, do you know people like you in the community that we might get together and have a Unitarian church? And so, some people were contacted here in Reno. I think they were mostly lawyers and arranged for a meeting. They arranged for a meeting in October of 1958. The executive director of the Pacific Central District and a representative from the, the Unitarian Association came to this meeting. So it was a big thing. And at that time, there were over 40 people that came. Sometime later, when they had bylaws drafted, there were 49 people that signed these bylaws. That was a good number here for Reno at that time, which was quite small. Now, the PCD director thought that the fellowship, or might, and it was called Reno Unitarian Fellowship at that time. And they thought it would be a good idea if the fellowship here shared a minister with the Chico Fellowship, which was newly organized. Now, Chico's over the hills, over the mountains. Um, they hired the Reverend Richard Bokey, who was the minister. He served for one year over the mountain, back and forth, winter not good. Uh, and they met in various places around town. They didn't have a permanent home, and so they met at the American Legion Hall, the Nevada Museum of Art, the Jewish Temple. And so moving around was not very conducive to having regular meetings. They met at 4 o'clock in the afternoon um, on a Sunday. It wasn't the regular church time. So in about 1962, they lost quite a few members because they moved from Reno. And the 
congregation dwindled quite a bit. It was in the doldrums. They didn't have many people at meetings. Jim and I came to the fellowship in 1963, and it was kind of in the doldrums at that time. So in the spring of 64, there was a meeting called of the congregation to decide whether we would continue or disband. The PCD came as a representative, and there was a person here from the UUA. I mean, they really thought we were important. <laughs> um, they pointed out at the time that we had some assets. Why should we disband? We had sev over $7,000 in a building fund. Somebody had given us uh, $2,000 earlier if we matched the fund, and the congregation at that time did. Then they bought some property and sold it at, at a good price and made a little money. So they had over this amount of money in the bank. He said, most congregations don't have that amount of money extra. And then another asset we had, we had a dedicated volunteer religious person who was interested in the education of her children. Uh, it was Billy Gus. She, her husband was in the chemistry department. And uh, I know Bob Sheridan knows of him. So um, he, Billy organized the teachers, and we had a large library of books from the Unitarian Religious Education Program. They said, and we had 15 children that came regularly every Sunday to church for religious education. So they said, why are you thinking about disbanding? And well, we don't have a place to meet. We don't have people that are willing to take the, the leadership positions. Be before that evening was over with, we had a president, a vice president, and a secretary. And we still had our religious education program. We had someone who agreed that they would restart the newsletter, who had, which had been published on a monthly basis. So we decided, OK, where are we going to meet? Jim and I volunteered that we could meet in our house on Sunday morning. That was another thing we changed. No more afternoon meetings. Sunday morning. So in a few months, they outgrew our small space. But we, we were lucky to be able to temporarily rent a building, the administration building of the school system, which had been vacated. It probably was ready to be torn down. <laughs> we went in scrubbed, swept, and painted. Nobody had to be an expert to do any of that. <laughs> and so we gathered sometimes two or three times a week. And we really bonded from that experience. <laughs> it was, and it, it looked halfway decent. We had to bring our own chairs to meet. Uh, some of them were there and not in good shape that the school system had left. But anyway, so we stayed there for a few years. We, uh, it, but it gave us a sense of place and who we were. And it was a good place for the religious education to begin after we cleaned up. I think it was important to us at that time, and I'm going to kind of go over a little bit, that we had the support of this Central Pacific District and the UUA. They provided us over the years with two minister on loan programs with lower interest loans at one time. They put uh, part-time ministers that we arranged to come here when we didn't have a full-time minister. And then, of course, a program to have a search 
for a full-time minister. So they were very helpful to us in the beginning years, and, and things have ch changed a little bit. We don't have the Pacific Central District anymore. We have a larger organization. Now, let's move backward in time to the 1800s. There were Unitarian congregations here at that time. And th th all the information is very sketchy because nobody kept any records. And the only records available are in diaries, in newspapers a little bit, or letters that somebody may have written. And then all these things deposited in a special collections or someplace they would be open to the public. There is a memoir from a woman who lived in Virginia City from about 1869 to 78 who says that there was a Unitarian church in Virginia City that met in the National Guards Hall. That's about all we know of that congregation. We have no information when it started or when it may have ended. There also was a Reno Unitarian Church here in 1892. So we don't know when, whether the two congregations may have had some relationship or not. The only reason we know about this congregation is from the minister that was here in 1892. And that was Myla Tupper Maynard. She came here as minister in that year with her husband, Raisin. Um, she had been minister in various churches in Indiana and Michigan. Um, she and her husband were co-ministers. She was uh, thought to be the first woman minister to come to Nevada in any congregation. And um, they not only organized the church here, but also gave lectures on various topics of the day. And she taught at the university for some classes. Uh, so she was kind of, a, a, had quite an influence in this city at that time. In 1894, the governor appointed her to attend the Congress of the National F Prison Association. And in the same year, he invited, she was invited to talk at a social reform for women con Congress in, uh, at their midwinter fair. So she had, she got around the country. That, that was in, I think, the Midwest. Uh, she addressed the Nevada State Assembly in, 19, in 1895 and talked the importance about the women's vote. She was quite a suffragette, supported the women's movement, and she was one of the few people that could, that was invited to address the Nevada Assembly. Um, one of her students was Ann Martin. Now, Ann Martin was the, probably the most famous suffragette in Nevada. And she wrote in her diary that she attended the Unitarian Church and she appreciated Myla Tupper Mainer's uh, teaching. She, uh, and I won't quote her because it, it gets a little long. But the Maynards left in 1895. So they weren't here a very long time. It is speculated that the main reason they left was because Myla supported Alice Hartley, who had shot her lover, a Reno banker and a legislature, when she became pregnant and he abandoned her. Now, Mrs. Miss Hartley was 
arrested and put in jail. But Myla paid her pastoral visits and in prison and during her trial. There was dissension in the city and somewhat in the congregation from the support that she was given. So the Maynards left. We have no idea what happened to the congregation after that. There's no records. The only records we have are when the Maynards were here as ministers. So um, now I'll move even further back in time. As you, during the period in the 1849s, when the gold rush came, of course, there was influx of people here coming from the West. And two young men, brothers, came from Pennsylvania. When I mention your, their names, you probably will re know from what denomination they are. Hosea Ballou Grosh and Ethan Allen Grosh. Their father was a Universalist minister in, in Pennsylvania. They came out here to be rich, get rich, whatever. And they, uh, in, in 1949, however, they sent letters back to their father. And there's a, there, the letters now belong to the Nevada Historical Association. They've been published in this book. But they have great value if, you're, if you ever want to read about what went in in a mining camp. And they traveled around to many mining camps, mostly on the, the Sierra side, the California side. But they didn't have much success. And so they came over the hill because they heard there was panning for gold here in Gold Canyon, up near Virginia City, Gold Hill, Silver City, that area. So they came here to see what they could find because they heard there was something called silver in quartz. And they wanted to see whether they could explore that rather than look for gold again. And they did. They found some outcropping of silver. It was in the fall. They decided it was not time to go over the mountains to have an assay made. So they stayed here. And the next spring, they found more of this silver. It, and they weren't doing, they were only doing above ground picking at rocks. So they, they stayed here that spring and summer, trying to make claims, get things organized so it would be theirs. And in September, Hosea hit his leg or foot with a pickaxe. And he died soon after of infection. Later in winter time, for some reason, Ethan Allen and a friend decided to go over the mountain and take their, their rocks to be assayed. And they spent four nights in the snow with little food. And when they were rescued, they both had soft frostbite. Ethan Allen died of frostbite, blood poisoning. So in a few months of each other, these two young men who had discovered the silver up in the Virginia City area died. Sad kind of thing. They, got, they have gotten very little recognition in the history books as the discoveries of the Comstock. Their names, however, are on the plaque, and you may have seen it, in Virginia City in that main uh, parking area on C Street. If you go, you'll see their names there. That's about the only recognition they have. Hosea Ballou is buried in the Silver City Cemetery. And if you like to go visit old cemeteries, 
it, it's a really interesting one, more and more interesting than the Virginia City one. So I advise you to do that. So the Grosh family, although there was some litigation, they got no money, no money at all from their son's discovery. So that's a sad, sad story. <laughs> now, we'll move a few years later to Thomas Starr King. All of us are familiar with his name, more so than the Grosh brothers. Um, Thomas Starr King was again the son of a Universalist minister. He got his education uh, from Hosea Ballou II, who was president of Tufts College, Puff, Tufts now, Tufts University. And he, he gave Star King, and he, that's the name he went by, Star King. It wasn't Thomas Star King, it was Star King. So um, he had great success in various churches preaching in the Boston and New England area in the 1880s, 1860s. And he was called to the Holly Unitarian Church in Boston, which he revitalized and had great success. He was a man of small stature with a booming voice. He was impressive. He spoke publicly about the issues of the day, particularly slavery. He was against slavery and spoke about it vehemently in many public places as well as his church. However, he was invited to come to the First Unitarian Society of San Francisco. He came here um, in, let's see, eight, 1880. Two. And he came to the church that was not doing well. But within two years, he had revitalized that church, and they had raised a lot of money to, buy, to build a new sanctuary that would seat 1,500 people. Now, that's an, that's an impressive number. 1,500 persons. Um, he made his mark in California during the Civil War. California had a lot of people that had migrated here from the South. So it was never a sure thing that California would vote to be part or stay part of the Union. So he went up and down the California coast preaching anti-slavery and that we must stay in the Union. And he has been given credit for that, for keeping California in the Union during the Civil War. Um, he came over the mountain. I, it's kind of sketchy, but I think he probably had congregants who had investments in the Comstock. It was the height of the Silver Session then. And he spoke in Washoe County, in, in the Valley, in Virginia City, in Carson City, and up and around this area. Um, he had a lot of following. And uh, it's, it's reported that when he came to Virginia City to give talks, there were the band came, showed up, there were parades, there was a lot of information out there that brought people in to hear him. And he spoke about the issues of the day. And he raised money for the sanitary fund, which was the forerunner of the Red Cross. So he was very active over here. He came a couple times across the mountain. He also came to recuperate at Lake Bigler. Lake Bigler, mean anything to you? He gave it, Star King gave it, or used the name Tahoe when he refer referred to it. 
and it, it has uh, Indian designation, me meaning big water. And there were friends of his who were in the newspaper business that decided to promote that name because they didn't like Bigler. Bigler was a Confederate, uh, I think, general or something. So they didn't want it. They wanted it to, to be uh, a name that changed. So Star King is credited with changing the name, although he didn't do it himself. It was his friends who were in the newspaper business. <laughs> Newspapers were important. That was the major way, besides speeches, of disseminating information. In March of 1964, 1864, thank you, David, <laughs> the church building was finished in San Francisco. He gave one sermon there and then contacted diphtheria and died soon after. The story of Thomas Starr King. He, he, California honored him with a statue, statue in Statuary Hall in U.S. Capitol. There's a statue of him in Golden Gate Park, and he is buried on the property of the church there in San Francisco. Uh, I think one of the few burials outside a cemetery in, in San Francisco. So his legacy does li live on. The, the congregation here has honored Myla Tupper Maynard, and Thomas Starr King, when this building was first built, we decided to name some of our rooms. And the congregation, we had a, a vote in a contest, and their names were chosen for the two of the rooms in the Religious Education Building. Um, I want to thank Nancy Oakley for the biographical information on uh, Myla Tupper Maynard. She did research and wrote a, a biography of, of her for the Nevada Women's History Project. And so that's where my information came. The other information came from either my memory or from uh, Jim's uh, book, little booklet about the history. And uh, I don't mind plagiarizing. Well, since the topic of today's is the UUFNN history, I thought it might be a good time to give a little perspective on the methods of raising money for the good of our fellowship and other nonprofits in our community. So when Lois and I joined 
There was no passing of the basket. Uh, perhaps it was a rebuke to uh, the practices of former churches that folks belong to. In fact, I don't recall money being mentioned much at all. Uh, it wasn't until we moved to our new property here uh, on Del Monte when we met in the Star King room uh, next door that we started having a basket. And even then, uh, we would it, we would be rather modest and say something like, uh, if you would like to donate, you can put the, your donation in the basket in the back. Uh, now, of course, we've gone high tech. <laughs> so for those of you on Zoom, or even those here in the room, you can text 73256, put UUFNN in the message box, and hit send. You can also mail checks to 780 Del Monte Lane, Reno 89511, or the best high tech of all, you can do automatic giving. So you can just contact the office for the form. Now, we did have parties to raise money. Uh, some of them became quite elaborate, like our, our St. Patrick's uh, Day events. Uh, now we have a phenomenal auction, and that's coming up soon. You, in fact, you may be already started to get notices for this year's auction and the e-announcements. Uh, and every Thursday you'll read about it. Now, did you notice that the theme and logo this year is May Day, May Day. So guess what the date that auction will be? And it's gonna be right after Sunday service. So today our auction donation station opens in the gathering room. It's actually out in, in the foyer. So stop by, using virus protocols, of course, no uh, crowding, and talk with Kathy and Sheila about your donations for this auction. So May Day, May Day is known to be a call for help. So please help make this a successful auction. Another recent addition, which we started while Reverend Anderson was here, uh, is what Siomara already referred to as share the plate, which is the concept to donate half of undesignated monies collected in the basket, plus those specifically designated to whatever cause. And as she mentioned, this recipient is the Northern Nevada Hopes, and, and I see Bill and Cindy Fogel here today. Uh, it's good to see them again. And I, well, I, I didn't mention it because of Bill and Cindy. I, I mentioned it because their daughter, Katie, actually is a physician assistant at Hopes. So, another reason to give. In our pledge drives, as you know, have been all over the board in the past. You know, but whatever the stewardship committee did this year has just been a phenomenal success. Now, I just want to say thank you to all who have committed to a sound and secure fellowship, uh, uh, future for our fellowship. You know, we have pledges in the amount of $333,353 so far towards our goal of 340000 Or that means we only have $6,647 to go. And 167 people have pledged so far with 42 increases, 14 new pledges. We are so close. So if you haven't filled out the pledge form, go online, complete the paperwork so our finance committee can complete next year's budget. And so thank you all so much for that. Yes, go ahead, give them a hand. <laughs> Would the ushers please come forward?
Would you join David and me in blessing these offerings to the work of this fellowship, which is helping more people grow in love, faith, justice, and joy. We dedicate ourselves and these our offerings. This is the moment in our service where we take some time for community prayer and meditation. Uh, those on Zoom, please go into the chat box and you can put in your joys and sorrows. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to all of us from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. May we all find love, peace, tranquility and justice in our times of sorrow and in our times of joy. doing our gesture, one hand on the heart and the other one out. These are the days that have been given to us. Let us rejoice and be glad in them. These are the days of our lives. Let, our lo let us live them well in love and service. These are the days of mystery and wonder. Let us cherish and celebrate them in gratitude together. These are the days that have been given to us. Let us make them stories worth telling to those who come after us.
Well, Betty just shared with us the early history of Unitarian Universalist in Western Nevada and California up to the time that she and Jim joined the fellowship. You know, they, as she mentioned, they were struggling, but wise advice from some UU leaders and a few dedicated members kept things going, meeting in various locations and homes. In fact, when Lois was starting her first year of teaching and I was about to finish college, we read about UUs in Life magazine in 1967, and we were intrigued. We looked into the phone book, remember those? <laughs> yeah, to see if there was UUs in Reno, and of course we dialed that number uh, that was listed, and as Betty mentioned, it was their home phone. <laughs> they told us they were meeting at the YWCA on Valley Road. Uh, when we arrived that first Sunday, we discovered that, yes, we were meeting at the Y, but it was in the foyer, <laughs> uh, although an active RE program was going on in the breakout rooms in the facility. And much to our surprise, several of our university teachers were members, including Jim Holtz, Elmer Rusko, and Jim McCormick. If you have attended one of our forums, you would get the idea of how the early services were conducted. A speaker would deliver his or her message, and that would be followed by a Q&A or some talk back. It, all, it was all very intellectual and inspiring. I don't recall any readings or music, but more on that later. We had a wonderful volunteer RE person, Betty mentioned, Billy Gus. We left shortly after we joined, we left, <laughs> we left shortly after we joined for two years while Dave was serving in the military. One of those years was spent in Virginia and we started attending Richmond UU Church. It was a real church with a building and a minister. <laughs> we were encouraged and thought, hmm, that we could do that here in Reno. <laughs> well, when we returned from the military and we were now parents, the UUs were still meeting at the YWCA but we soon moved to something called the Center for Religion and Life. Uh, it was a building that was owned by the Catholic Church across from campus and was part of an ecumenical program involving Protestant and Catholic activities. It was a great meeting place for the adults, but mm, the RE kids had to meet downstairs in a coffee shop. It was not always left in the cleanest of conditions, but, uh, and there were no separate rooms. But this was a time of many changes in our fellowship. <laughs> we started to be more spiritual in our approach to our services. People like Joyce Fisher and Sandy Young had moved to Reno and introduced us to music. We found out we could really sing and enjoy it. We didn't always have to read the words ahead to see if we agreed with them or not. Just sing. <laughs> we probably could have stayed there indefinitely, but the Catholic Church, they had other ideas. A new bishop came to town and didn't like sharing the property with the non-Catholics, and that included us. We were asked to leave. It was then a mad scramble. Where will we go? Bill Isaiah's grandmother lived in a senior living facility off the Audi Boulevard, in Sparks, and they said we could use their clubhouse. Well, it was a nice gesture, but it was still very small. In fact, there was virtually zero RE space. There were times when I brought a tent so we could put it up and have space for our kids. And it was there Dave and I celebrated our 22nd anniversary by renewing our vows with Beth Isaiah officiating. <laughs> well, we then found a theater where we could meet that was close to the pepper mill. It was called the Black Box Theater. <laughs> and was it ever black? It was very dark inside and everything was, well, black. <laughs> the only space available for RE was the dressing room. Now, can you picture, put in your imagination what would happen when you put a bunch of UU kids in a dressing room full of wigs and costumes. 
You know, in the end, that was probably the best thing that happened to us. <laughs> it forced the issue of finding a permanent home. Fortunately, Betty had mentioned we already had a building fund and we'd accumulated some dollars in there and we purchased the property that we sit on now and this was just a pasture. There were no trees. People have a hard time imagining looking out here now. There was a new freeway being built close by and the houses were being auctioned off to make way for a new road. Uh, we, we authorized uh, one of our members, Elmer Rusco, to bid on one of them and up to a thousand dollars. But we were outbid by a hundred dollars. The next day the woman who bought it called and said she thought her son could use it but he wasn't interested. So she sold it to us for a thousand dollars. Then we had to move it <laughs> to our, this property, do some major work and make it feasible to work for us. And while we had some guidance from the contractor, we decided to do most of the work ourselves. I still marvel that no one was seriously hurt since we had piece, folks up on the, on the roof pulling off the tiles, and at the same time, people were working on the outside walls. Uh, the corner, um, in the corner of the Star King room was a fireplace which we had removed. Our daughter, Amy June, one day was helping us sweeping, and she was sweeping and backing up, and all of a sudden, she fell in the hole. <laughs> Again, no one was hurt. <laughs> well, trees were planted, and a septic tank was installed. We were still in the county then. We often had Dr. Hulse, a distinguished history professor, <laughs> dipping a long stick into the tank to see if it needed to be emptied. We knocked out a wall of the small room next to the Star King room. So we had an L-shaped meeting room that could all hold 80 people maximum. Well, it didn't take long to outgrow that space. So we made a decision to have a capital campaign to raise money to build this sanctuary. Well, UUA and our regional people did a survey it was determined the most we could raise would maybe 300,000. Well, the board thought that was too low and said, hey, we can raise 400,000 if we really go for it. And in the end, we raised over $600,000, thanks to many generous folks, some who weren't even members of our fellowship. We still had to borrow to, to finish the job, and we're staying, still paying off that debt. We then had to move to our, our move our services to Swope Middle School while all the construction was happening. While it had classrooms that the kids could meet in, the adults were in the cafeteria with the horrible smell of sour milk. Let's just say it was a wonder that people like Gaia Brown and Lloyd Rogers and others that joined us then stayed with us. <laughs> This building was dedicated 20 years ago. We know that because Dave and I celebrated our 60th birthdays in this various room throwing a huge party. It was really fun and we're just about ready to turn 80, so now you know how long ago that was. <laughs> and sorry folks, we're not having a party this time. <laughs> so our members were always involved in social justice as part of our spiritual practice. Several were deeply involved in civil rights issues, especially Jim Hulse and Elmer Rusco. Women's rights were always the top of our agendas. And for years we were involved with it, it was called the Interfaith Hospitality Network where we had folks with no homes who stayed at our fellowship each night for a week and we would cook meals for them and we shared these responsibilities with other congregations around the community. It was all very rewarding, but unfortunately the organization fell on hard times and doesn't exist any longer. Well, several years ago we applied for and went through a necessary step to be named a welcoming community, which we mention every week in our welcoming. Now with Reverend Anderson and now Reverend Foster, we have stepped up our involvement with immigration issues, racial justice, support of the LBGTQ community, climate issues, and so much more. Our fellowship is always supported, as Betty said, 
the Unitarian Universalist Association, their service committee, and our regional programs. So as you can see, we have had a colorful and fascinating history. There are so many stories to tell. There's just one, just not enough time to share them all. We are here, we are at an exciting time, and we see our fellowship continuing to grow and prosper. We know that we will con continue to have a major impact on people's lives, both within the, our fellowship and out in the larger community. We are blessed to have dynamic leaders. The board is doing a wonderful job. The music under Bill Quimby is now starting to regroup and are sounding great. <laughs> Kristen Famula is sharing her talents and is a wonderful person. Karen, Reverend Karen, is much loved and we can't wait to have her back next month. I want to say we've had all kinds of ministerial arrangements over the years, from part-time to shared ministries to short-term to interim to extension. Uh, we've had lay people who designated ministers for marriage, and Jim Hulse and Betty Isaiah carried those titles. Now, back when we were trying to decide whether to hire a full-time minister or build a, the uh, a building for the congregation, uh, we decided to have a vote. And as Jim Hull said in his little booklet that he wrote in 2008 about our history, with teenage exuberance, <laughs> we decided to do both. We did. <laughs> we always seem to step forward and think big when it matters. Now, both Lois and I love this fellowship, and we have grown so much by in being involved in many aspects of the church. When we first joined, it was an a rewarding intellectual dimension that added to our lives. As we have seen our fellowship grow, and so many new people have come into this fellowship and made our lives richer, we can now say that we not only enjoy the intellectual aspect, but we have grown spiritually in so many ways. UUFNN has been a gift that keeps on going and keeps on giving. And back in the 80s, when we were meeting at the Center for Religion and Life, we had a frequent guest who was a singing minister by the name of Rick Matson. What a joy he was. But he unfortunately died of AIDS. But he left behind one song from our 1993 hymnal entitled, Let There Be a Dance. It's one of our favorites, so now, Let's sing and let's all dance.
That was awesome. That was awesome. I have missed those moments so much. That was really awesome. So thank you all for joining us today. Once again, it was awesome. Uh, programming, if you want, please watch your emails. There's a lot of information there. Please read it so you could have uh, the information you need to be able to do other things. If um, if you want to receive our emails, please go to our website and fill the card there so we know that, uh, to send it to you. Um, share this link with other people. If you know someone that needs help in any way, form, or shape, please contact them, get to them, help them out, give them a hand, at least give them a shoulder where they could cry or laugh. And any other announcements, David? Nope? Okay. So don't forget, coffee hour in three minutes after, and small groups conversation. Once again, thank you for being here today. I close with the words of Laurel and Bellamy. If here you have found freedom, take it with you into the world. If here you have found comfort, go and share it with others. If you have dreamed dreams, help one another that they may come true. If you have known love, give some back to a bruised and hurting world. Go in peace. Amen and namaste.